kid. Seriously. Hey, everybody. Welcome to an ambivalent return of the Kids Seriously show. We are the only podcast that makes sure you always Michael down your Vincents. I am most obviously not Maya Madrid, who is actually uh, not with us today because he is helping to further the generations to come after us while I am here bitching about Star Wars on the internet like a good solid American. But don't worry, I won't be doing it alone. I have a partner who has returned from abroad. It is the return of Mark Neitzel, who uh, makes more money than me. He travels more than me. He's better educated than me, but I am two inches taller. So in the end, it's a net win for me. So Mark, how you doing there, buddy? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm hanging in there. Um, after two weeks abroad and six plane travels, I caught every cold virus ever known to man. So I'm coughing, I'm clogged, I'm draining, uh, I'm exhausted, and I, I would probably pass out right now if the congestion wouldn't choke me awake. Perfect. perfect. It's like uh, Mr. Burns on the, the open door. Everyone's trying to get through it once, so now you're indestructible. There you go. Nice. So. Nice. Well, why don't we just jump into this? Because, you know, uh, it's our show without my here, and we'll just do whatever the fuck we want. Hey, it works for me. All right. Plus, Ron, uh, I've got a lot of um, NyQuil and cold medicine in me, so we're kind of on a ticking clock scenario here. Nice, nice. I like it. Let's jump right into it with a little bit of news. <laughs> So Disney has officially announced their streaming channel that they've been talking about for a while. It's going to be called Disney Play, and it's going to be their prime focus coming up in 2019. Obviously, this relates to Star Wars because they're going to be launching multiple Star Wars shows, starting with the Jon Favreau show that is uh, rumored to be about the Mandalorian Bubba Fett planet. Now, my question to you on this is, how many streaming services are you already subscribed to, and does Disney's interest you? Well, let's see. So, how many streaming services? Um, I have the WWE Network, because I haven't figured out how to cancel it after my one-night semi-drunken ordering so I could get WrestleMania. Nice. Um, yeah. I've got, um, I think my wife has HBO and Showtime and Stars. Um, we've got Hulu. Uh, we've got Netflix. We've got Amazon Prime. So, I mean, at this point, as far as Disney goes, why the hell not? What's 10 more dollars a month? I don't know that I'm really excited about it. You know, unless they can bring back some of those uh, old Danger Cove episodes from the 80s when we used to have the Disney Channel. Nice. But, um, yeah, you know, not, not especially. I feel like I'm going to get my Star Wars stuff at the movie theater, and I don't know that I need any more. What about you? I, I, have, I have kids, unlike you, so I think we'll be a little more willing to do it because they actually will watch a lot of shows on Netflix that are Disney channel related shows and i my it, see, it sounds like most of that stuff is going to get yanked from netflix once this comes out i know they already announced that ant-man and the wasp will be the last marvel movie that ends up on netflix oh and, wait a minute wait a minute hold on hold on yeah i totally didn't think about that yeah um, okay yeah no no I'll, I'll definitely be getting it now yeah and i i, I tend to think ten dollars a month to have if they have every single Marvel Cinematic Universe movie on there, every single, you know, Touchdown movie on there, every single Star Wars movie, all that. I mean, I don't really buy Blu-rays and DVDs anymore. I, I honestly would rather just subscribe to this and have it all there when I want it. Yeah, I'm down with that. Uh, yeah, no, it'll, it'll be just like the movie selection that I had available to me on my first class flight to Paris two and a half weeks ago. Nice. Nice. Yes. You are so such a gallivanting man of the world. I, I am a baller, yes. And and we won't tell all of our viewers and listeners that it's only really because I'm married. It has almost nothing to do with me as an earner. There is no shame in being a trophy husband. I think it's uh, something we I, all strive for. I, I am well kept. Nice. 
Nice. So our second bit of Star Wars news is uh, a couple casting announcements they made for Episode Nine. The rumor is they're looking for a young Charlize Theron type, which okay, you want to yeah, you want a generic Hollywood blonde. That's impressive. Uh, and then the uh, not that Charlize Theron's a generic actor, but that's what that description sounds like to me. And then they cast uh, Matt Smith, who is best known for being Doctor Who and for being Prince Philip in The Crown. Now, I, I don't really care enough to speculate about what parts they're going to play, because I don't think it, it matters at this stage, and I kind of think that's less fun than finding out. But with the casting of someone like Matt Smith, I have to ask the question, because I honestly don't know this. Have you ever watched Doctor Who? Um, <clears throat> so... It, this will get a, a little into the, the history for our, our listeners here, but the only time I've ever watched Doctor Who is back when I was in elementary school, um, when I would sleep over at Nick Siccarelli's house. Huh. We would sleep in the basement, and they had a massive TV. Like, it was a big screen, like 40-inch. But, you know, so it's, you know, a 1980s 40-inch TV, right? That's insane. And they couldn't turn it off. Because if they turned it off, they could never turn it back on. So what they would do is they would just turn it to PBS when they all went to bed and then just mute the sound. Huh. So several times I woke up in the middle of the night, you know, from my deep slumber in a strange house, sleeping on the floor, to see these episodes of Doctor Who play silently with no context. Uh freaked me the shit out. I was going to say, that sounds like it could be a nightmare. Yeah. So, um, technically, yes, uh, but no, I have never voluntarily watched an episode, nor could I tell you almost anything about it. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat. I've never seen an episode, and the, the only thing I can say that I, <clears throat> I really know about it is what I've gotten from watching characters on the show Community, watching Specter Space Time. Um, and I'm not sure how accurate and close that is, but, uh, hopefully Matt Smith works out. I'm sure he's fine. I watched an episode of the crown and then I got confused as to which repressed British monarchy show I was watching because my partner watches probably 30 of those. And I couldn't tell you which was which after a while. So I guess we'll just, uh, we'll just have to see what happens. But the real question is in the episode, did you watch, did Lady Maplethorpe's Roses win the annual cotillion or was it you know a lowly commoner who somehow managed to steal the title from her yes but at the same time there was some uh servant people who repressed their feelings about each other because they weren't allowed to express them being commoners so uh, it was that episode of the show so touching exactly uh let, let's move beyond the news let's go into something a little more fun because this is <clears throat> actually my favorite part of the show and that is uh we're gonna play a little a little pop culture quiz show that we like to call Am I Right or Am I Wrong? And what this is, is we take a, a bunch of random questions going on in pop culture. We, we ask them to a, a player. In this case, sometimes we have two players, but this week we're only going to have one, who's going to be Mark Neitzel. And he has to answer them, and I just kind of get to arbitrarily decide if he gets the correct answer or not. So it's, it's fun for me as the person calling it out. And we have seven questions. So to win this game, you need to get at least four of them right. So, Mark, are you ready to start this out? I was told there would be no math involved in this podcast. Don't worry. There shouldn't be too much math. All right. We'll keep it simple. You can use your hands, so that's fine. Fire away. Well, we're, we're starting out in one of your wheelhouses, which is uh, White Rappers. And, uh, you know, controversial and legendary white rapper Clint Dempsey recently announced that he's going to retire from his side gig as a soccer player for the Seattle Sounders and longtime national team legend. So De Dempsey's had quite the career. He is the tied for all time leading scorer for U.S. soccer uh, for goals, 57 goals tied with Landon Donovan. He played at length for Fulham in the EPL, and I believe he is their all-time leading scorer in the Premier League. So not the club's overall lead scorer, but no one has scored more in the Premier League for them than Clint Dempsey. He's won an MLS Cup. So the question here is, where does Clint Dempsey rank for you among all-time U.S. soccer men? Hmm. Okay, well, first off, I'm glad you qualified men because nobody's beating Wambach. Um, I would 
put him second to Donovan. Um, the, the reason I would go with Donovan only because I, I think Donovan was a little more useful all around the field, um, more assists, um, more of a factor tracking back for defense. Um, so, you know, I mean, Clint Dempsey is a number nine up front striker, um, and he was fantastic at it, but it's a more limited role. And so if I've got to pick one guy who's going to be on the field, um, I, I'm going to take Donovan over him. So, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a point on there, and, and what you said about Donovan is 100% correct. It's not just that he has a few more assists. He has, like, 50, 60 more assists than Dempsey does. So anyone who tries to make that argument, I think, is being ridiculous. I, I had him listed fourth overall for me, for men. And I'm, I'm going to admit, as I think pretty much everyone living needs to admit, we don't know shit about the 1950 team, so it's impossible to really gauge any of them. So I'm, I'm starting in the, the 90s, and I'm going to put Landon Donovan as, as my number one. Then number two, I'm going to go with Tab Ramos. Number three, I'm going to go Claudio Reyna, and then I'm going to put Dempsey right there at four. And um, I think it's it's been said by people more educated, especially at the time Ramos was playing, that he's probably the most talented player the U.S. has ever had. But yeah. Donovan was by far the most impactful, and I put Ramos and Reyna ahead of Dempsey because they were in a time where the program really needed them to build a lot more. And as you mentioned, they played a position that impacted the field a lot more than uh, what Dempsey did, even though obviously what he did is important. So uh, I, I would go with Ramos over Dempsey, I think, except after Ramos took that elbow to the head in the 94 World Cup, I don't think he ever completely recovered from that. Yeah, um, I think his play was negatively affected after that. And so I don't think overall, with what happened on the pitch, he had the career that Dempsey had. Um, I think he had the skills to be much better. He probably could have been better than Donovan. Um, but I, I think his development and uh, everything was stunted as a result of that. I would also argue um, in there um, either um, Tim Howard um, or Casey Keller. Um, <laughs> Because I, you know, very underappreciated position uh, on the soccer pitch, but they really dominated for a long time at really high levels. And I think, yeah, I think that's a good call too. And I've always been for a long time. I said before Donovan really ramped up that I thought Casey Keller was the best player we had ever produced. And I don't, I don't believe that statement anymore. Obviously, by my rankings. And I think I would have to put Howard slightly ahead of Casey Keller. Now, if you're asking me who I want for one game playing their absolute best, it would be Casey Keller, but Tim Howard has the better career. And before, you know, our millions upon millions of listeners want to lash out at me about the 17 saves or whatever against Belgium, go find some video of Casey Keller beating Brazil almost single-handedly. Yeah. Perfect. So you get a point there. So a good way to start out. We're going to move to question two. We're going to stick with sports and we're going to, uh, Talk Derek Jeter, who, you know, on top of being a handsome man, is also the world's douchiest sports owner. He didn't quite seem to realize that when you trade away every half-decent player you've ever had, and you're already owning a team like the Miami Marlins that no one goes to when they are good, that you're really not going to get people to go to your team when you have nothing to watch and no one to cheer for. So his way of pumping that up is they're going to steal a note from our favorite sports, soccer, and create their own supporters section where they are encouraging people to bring flags and instruments and horns to try and generate excitement in a stadium that generally looks about 5% full. So this is a two-part question. Will this tactic work to bring people in? And is it good for other sports to be taking this type of thing from soccer? Okay. Well, first one... Uh, I'm going to say no, and I'm going to admit my anti-baseball bias here. Um, in fact, last uh, right after we got back from our vacation, um, my wife got the company seats to the Giants game, and they're 10th row behind home plate. We went there, got our food, sat down, lasted two innings, and left. Nice. Uh, now, those two innings were 40 minutes long. So, you know, we did almost a full soccer half there. 
But uh, we're going to start by saying I'm, I'm not much of a baseball guy. Uh, listen, I, I think it's not going to help. Um, not only because of just Miami is generally a bad sports town, um, and I don't think that that's going to be enough to attract it. A, baseball in general, it's not the fact that they don't have TIFO. It's the fact that it's a five-hour game and 165 a season. It's just it's too much. It's too exhausting. I mean, good God, can you imagine trying to sing for nine full innings? <laughs> no. Now, having said that, for the longest time, um, back when I was a really big into the NFL, before all of the concussion stuff really kind of soured me on it, I had long prayed for the NFL to be adopting those kind of things. I mean, can you imagine, uh, you know, flares and flags, uh, you know, going off at the new Viking Stadium? I, I, that would be amazing. Uh, that would be uh, incredible. And, you know, for the longest time, before we really had MLS, I, I really lamented the fact that people didn't get into sports here like they did um, over there. I mean, college football, yeah, you get some stadiums that are pretty into it at that kind of level. But, I mean, you know, nothing's going to match the, the wall at Dortmund, right? So, yeah, any chance you can get to increase – the, the live experience um, at any sport, I would be all for. Yeah, you, you got this pretty right, so I'll, I'll give you the, the point. You hit a couple key factors that I wanted you to. I do think it will help them, but not not much. It, it'll be better than not doing it for the Marlins, but it's not going to fill that stadium up. But maybe maybe you can get at least everyone to sit together in one section so it doesn't look quite as terrible. So I think it will help a little. But yeah, anytime. Anytime you're taking something that that's you know fun and inspiring enthusiasm, I think it's good for sports. And I liked that you mentioned how college sports do do this more, and everyone loves that at college sports. We here, my my partner is a big Badger fan, so we go to a lot of Badger games. Uh, she's going tomorrow, actually, to the Badger game, and watching that student section is my favorite part of going to those games. Not being a massive college football fan, so I I think it's something that that people will like and embrace. Um, and let's, let's see it at more places. There are a couple other non soccer teams that do this. The LA Kings do it. And I don't know how successful it is. And locally here, the Milwaukee bucks do it. And it is makes, it does make the environment more, more fun than what you normally would get from a bucks game before. Because there is nothing sadder than going to a baseball game and watching people sit on their hands and have to have a freaking pipe organ get them, you know, woken from their slumber in order to care about the game for five minutes. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. it's something. So, all right, you're, you're sitting pretty good here. This is two for two already, so you're flying out of the gate. But we're going to switch gears now. HBO recently wrapped its miniseries Sharp Objects, which got a lot of crimi- uh, cl- uh, critical acclaim, based mostly on fantastic editing and soul-crushing performance from Amy Adams. <laughs> Now, my partner and I greatly enjoyed this show, even though we debated about whether the ending was good or not. But HBO in general has a pretty long history of being the gold standard for original TV shows. Too many to to name. We all know them now by heart, and we all know that a bunch of new ones are probably always around the corner for them. So you have to say they're the leader, but what network is your second go-to as far as original programming? Well, that's easy. FX. Um... Uh, at FX by a mile. I mean, it started with The Shield, which is the greatest non-HBO drama. Um, and, coincidentally, and I'm pretty sure you'll agree with me on this, has the single greatest final episode in the history of television. Um, but, you know, you've got only that. You've got Always Sunny in Philadelphia. You've got Archer. You had um, Sons of Anarchy, which was really good for four seasons, and then kind of petered off at the end. But, uh, I mean, even some of their lesser stuff, like uh, Terriers or Wilfred, even when it either bombs or just doesn't that great, at least it's experimental and it's interesting. I mean, I'm not into American Horror Story, but, uh, you know, that's another big runaway success for them. So, I, you know, when it comes to if I'm up late at night and some network's reruns are going to be airing, if it's an FX show rerun, I'm always watching that. All right, well, sadly here I can't award you a point, and it's not because you didn't pick the right network. 
You definitely did, and this should have made it an easy question, but the fact is, is you listed off numerous shows, and you didn't mention Atlanta or Fargo. So I'm sorry, I can't award you a point unless you're going to acknowledge those. And also, with your greatest ending ever, you are throwing out both Newhart and The Larry Sanders Show, and I find that reprehensible. No, 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 no. Newhart has the greatest final two minutes in the history. The rest of that episode isn't isn't anything to, to sneeze about. Uh, Larry Sanders Show, I, I don't remember the last one of that one. So uh, You don't remember I'll, the last I'll one. You, that can, could, can you, that. you don't remember Tom Petty and Clint Black fighting over who gets to sing to him, ripping on Greg oh. Kinnear for being on Talk Soup. Come yeah, on! Well, yes, I do remember that moment, but I don't remember the rest. Well, it's great, and I blame you. You don't get a point. So it's it's two to one. Wait, wait, wait. Could I also add as a runner up um, Cinemax because they did have both Red Shoes Diaries and uh, Hot Springs Hotel, which a thirteen year old me really appreciated. Yeah, I'm sorry, but again, factually, you're you're losing out here because Red Shoe Diaries was on Showtime. Really? It was. I know my late night Showtime and my late night Cinemax. Those are important uh. distinctions. So, yeah, yeah. But let's move on to question four. See if you can rebound. And one of these things, you've been gone. And while you've been while you've been gone, I've been trying to give Maya kind of some practice rounds. Because he hasn't gotten to do this a lot. Normally he reads the questions. But we thought he was probably going to have to face you soon in a number one contenders match. So we tried to get him some practice. And okay. one of the hallmarks of me running this segment while you've been gone is me spending way too much time on DC stuff. Because really, who gives a shit? But somehow I managed to force it in there anyway. So I'm not going to do that this week. Thank you. Instead, we're going to go a little more Liefeld on it, and we're going to talk about some Image Comics, because okay. the Spawn movie is picking up steam. Now, uh, Jamie Foxx, the Oscar winner, has been announced as signed to play the hero, and the director-creator, Todd McFarland, has signed a special effects artist this week, as well as made comments about updating the costume and why diehard fans shouldn't be upset about the changes he's making to the costume. Now, those of you who know you well know that you were an avid Spawn collector. I believe, what, 1 through 20-something? Yeah, that yeah. sounds about right. To start out with. So this is the second attempt at the Spawn movie. I don't know why they want to improve on the perfection of the first, but whatever. So let, let's take Spawn out of the equation. What image comic should be made into a movie next? Hmm, well... Um, what image comic should be made into the next movie? There is one, you may not even be aware of it, um, but not only would I love to see Image try it, but I just, the meta joke would be lost on so many people and that would be awesome. Rob Liefeld recently created a character called The Pouch. <laughs> and The Pouch is a walking, talking collection of pouches. Wow. So he does have some He does have some self-awareness. Yes, yes. Now, he never draws the pouch's feet, but it's <laughs> all pouches. So, um, and no, obviously I'm not going to go with that because that would be a, I mean, that's barely enough material for a Saturday Night Live to get much less a movie. Um, I am going to go with... Images Chew, which uh, I don't know if you know that, that is about a police detective in kind of this fictional world where everybody's superpowers relate around food. So, for example, when he, the lead character, Tony uh, Chew, takes a bite out of something, he immediately knows its entire history. So if he comes across a murder victim, he takes a bite out of the murder victim, he can see who killed him. And, and there's all other kinds of stuff, but it's this whole world where everything is based around food, and it's really amusing, and I think that that would, would really play well in a, in a film setting. Well, the answer I had written down is Chew. So, oh, wow. well done, because that, that, is, a, it, that is awesome. Uh, you know, I've, I've only read the... Come best friends! Yeah, I've I've only we just did. I've only read a few few issues of it, but it's great. And the other thing I like about it is I don't I don't want to see uh a just image make a superhero movie in the vein of Marvel and and DC. And 
which is why I'm not excited for Spawn, even though I have nothing against Spawn as a character. Like, let's let's take comic book movies in a new direction, and Chu is a great way to take these things in a new direction that would be interesting and fun and unique. Not just another, you know, guy in tights who has superpowers. Like, let's let's do let's get weird with it. So well done, sir. I was I wasn't sure I was thinking you weren't going to pick that because you weren't gonna think I knew about it. So So I'm I'm impressed with you going with your heart rather than just, you know, picking wildcats or something because I know what that is. <laughs> so so three to one, you're looking pretty good. You only need one more out of these next three. And right, so should I tank a couple just to create some drama? Well, I might just tank you in a few, you know. I mean, the the, the points are arbitrary, so I could yeah. just tank them all if I want, even if you give me the right answer. Fair enough. So question five. When this episode of our show airs, it is going to be September, even though we're recording it in August, the end of August, which means we are getting close to my favorite time of the year, which is Halloween. So we all know that... Night of the Living Dead is the best horror movie ever made, probably the best movie ever made. We're massive fans, and we've both probably seen it a combined 500 times. So we, we got to take that one out, because that's just too simple. But as we get to Halloween, what's your go-to Halloween movie besides that? Okay, well, do I have to take out uh, Dawn of the Dead, too, the original one? All I said is you have to take out Night of the Living Dead. Oh, then Dawn of the Dead. And Why? <laughs> You have to explain you yourself. To, you need me to explain why? I would like um, you to, yes. It's, it's got all of Romero's um, social commentary using zombies to actually talk about something as opposed to just being fast and killer and, you know, something to set to a Johnny Cash soundtrack. Um, so it's got humor. It's got tension. It's... Uh, creepy and disturbing, but it doesn't rely just on jump cuts and, um, you know, shock value. Uh, it's a complete movie. And, and you can also just, um, find it on, in full on YouTube. So it's really easy to watch as well. I don't have to try and find some streaming services for it. So the original 78, I believe Dawn of the Dead. So I'm not going to give you this point, even though that is a good movie. But I don't think of it as a great Halloween movie for a couple reasons. First off, well, the main reason, I don't think it's as rewatchable as a lot of Halloween movies. Um, and, and I think it's not as scary as a lot of Halloween movies, especially after the opening sequence, which is very well done. And shockingly violent, even though the effects are dated. It's still, when you watch a movie and you think of it at that era, when you actually then see how violent it immediately gets even though the you know the blood spray is kind of kind of corny it, yeah. it's shockingly violent but because that movie has so much social commentary and such good social commentary it's not that scary a movie to me um it, it's more interesting for for who the characters are and stuff like that but it's not a movie i watch and get scared so while i really like it and really enjoy it i, I just can't put it up there as a, a halloween movie I, I i'll put it more in the uh the, the post-Christmas Oscar season lull where um, all the movies coming out in theaters are garbage because the Oscar movies already came out and studios are dumping things and you need something something good and intelligent to watch. So I'm, I'm sorry. It's a good movie, but it's it's one you should wait till after Halloween for. Oh, disappointed in you. So now you're down to three to two. Well, are you going to give me the correct answer at least? Um, actually, what I had is, is any justifiable movie written down, and I've deemed what you said not justifiable. Oh. So, but I generally, um, for me, I always watch, um, I always watch Night of the Living Dead on Halloween, I always watch Freaks on actual Halloween, and I generally try to watch, um, either The Omen or The Exorcist in alternating years on Devil's Night. So, that's my, my little slate of things I kind of always do. Do. Oh, and I always try to throw The Descent in there, because I think the, the Descent is the actual scariest movie I've ever watched, and it scares me every time I watch it. Not as much because of monster factors, but because Cave Spelunking seems like the most terrifying, horrible thing to me that could possibly happen. Yeah, I'm looking on that. So you are now down to a 50% chance of pulling this out, because we have two questions left, and you need to get one or the other. So we're both big fans of podcasts. We're both big fans of true crime. We're fans of 
true crime where the mystery has never been solved. And I just finished two podcasts. I finished the RFK tapes, which had its last episode this week, which is about JF or RFK uh, assassination theories and conspiracies. And then I also finished the third season of Criminology, which is about Ted Bundy and had previously they've done the Zodiac and uh, the EAR, which at the time were both unsolved mysteries. So my question for you, because you're generally pretty good at this stuff, is I need a new mystery. It doesn't have to be in podcast form, but I need a new mystery I haven't explored to check out. So what should I be looking for? Hmm, a new mystery that you haven't explored. Um, well, there are a couple that um, immediately come to mind. Um, the, the first one, and I don't know if you know about this one, but... This will be my answer because I'm going to pretend you don't know about it. Uh, it's the Summerton. It is a guy uh, in 1949, I think, who uh, mysteriously died from poisoning on the beach in Australia. And um, when he was found, he had no identification. The tags had been removed from all of his clothes. Um, any identifying marks were gone. He was never identified. Um, however, they did find that he had a obscure book of poetry that he had scribbled codes in, and he left it in the back seat of a car of a mysterious woman who may or may not know who it was. Yeah, I'm going to go with the Summerton Man um, as probably kind of the most enduring um sort of true crime, mis unsolved mystery that's out there right now. Uh, second would be the Diablo Pass incident, uh, where seven hikers uh, in a mountain in Russia, for some reason, were camped out in a tent overnight, and in a panic, they immediately tore themselves out of the tent and all ran into the wilderness and froze to death, and nobody knows what happened and why they did that. So there's my answers. Oh, Feel that free to they're they're Not, good they're good answers, but I've watched probably four documentaries on the Summerton Man and uh, a few different podcasts on it. So while it is it is fascinating, I was looking for a new one, and the same with Diablo Pass. So great great mysteries, but I can't give you the point because I am familiar with those, which means we are down to the wire. We are on to question seven. You're sitting at three three. And wait wait wait. Do you know about the Mothman? <laughs> Yeah, Kevin Costner fights him, I believe, in a movie. Or is that Richard Gere? I can't remember which one. So, we are down to question seven, and uh, this is going to be make or break time for you. As we mentioned earlier, you are a world traveler. You just got back from Greece, uh, Italy, France, Germany. You've been to Europe multiple times. You've been across the U.S., multiple different places in the Caribbean, all that type of place. So, uh, where are you going next that you haven't been? Hmm. Well, the, the most likely one is going to be Vancouver, Canada to see the Whitecaps play my San Jose Earthquakes. I thought you'd been to Vancouver already. I've never been to Vancouver. Oh, well, uh, the answer I have written down is never. it doesn't matter. Going somewhere new is always awesome. So you pulled hey. it out, buddy. That's uh, that's a four for three. So well, well done. You win this round, and uh, hopefully next week we can uh, pair you up against uh, a fit and trained Maya and uh, see who can win that number one contender spot. Well, maybe it's time to move on then, and we can go into everyone's favorite segment where we answer questions that kids seriously got. And I am legitimately really excited for this one because. This is someone who has never written us a question, and it's by far our best listener that we have, so I'm really, really excited about it. So, the legendary, the one, the only Jim in Milwaukee has written in to us, and he says, Hey guys, love the show, just wanted to know, will the creation of a general purpose AI lead to the end of humanity's dominance on the planet? Discuss. Well, it already has, because at the campus I work at, they have these adorable little robots that come around and deliver food to students or employees. And they have these little displays and they've got faces on them. And um, when you get in its way, it will 
stop and it will make you know a smiley face at you if if you stand in front of it too long its eyes will turn into hearts um it can also get a little frustrated so they've already taken over the food delivery industry in my neck of the woods which i think if anybody is familiar with the works of asimov's for bradbury is step number one in robot dominance so we're living in it okay i have two questions that this has brought to mind to me the first off is do you think it could win in a battle with a boston scientific dog boston scientific dog oh wait is that that giant those things that can open doors and and chase people in uh in that black mirror i i feel like it could outsmart them yes it's like it is the brain bug version of the robots may not be the best physical fighter but it's gonna lead them nice my next question then and probably the more important one is what type of face does it make when you whip your dick out when it's uh in your way um it just takes a picture and contacts the local police department (laughs) nice it's probably the best answer uh for me i i'm going to say that ai is going to lead to the end of us but not in a terminator sort of way more in a wally it's going to do everything for us and we'll just become more fatter and immobile and basically go nowhere so you mean you mean it'll do stuff like deliver our food for us (laughs) exactly exactly so thanks jim write in more you're the best guy ever Let's move on. Well, now it is time to talk Clone Wars as we shift gears into Season 2, Episode 7, entitled Legacy of Terror. It was written by a guy with an impossible to pronounce Irish first name that I'm just going to say is Yogan Mahoney and directed by Stuart Lee. This episode is about Luminara who disappears during a sandstorm after she's following Poggle the Lesser, Anakin and Obi-Wan go to find her, and spooky things happen. Mark, why don't you hit us with the blue writing? Sometimes accepting help is harder than offering it. True. True. Accepting is actually a hard word to say. It can be. So in this episode, our third on Geonosis, the battle has been won. The Jedi have destroyed all the droid factories. They've taken heavy casualties, and now they're cleaning up and basically trying to find Poggle the Lesser, who has managed to escape. Luminari and Obi-Wan are kind of in charge. The two Padawans that we focused on in the last episode have left to go do other things. And uh, Luminara decides she is going to go off on her own with some clones to go find Poggle. Poggle is uh, fleeing on a tank. He's carrying some big boxes behind him that fall off. Ask a quick question. Yeah. Just taking this planet and you're chasing the leader of a major uh, separatist organization. Shouldn't you send maybe more than one? Jedi and like five troops. I mean, wouldn't you send your whole army after somebody like that? I mean, it kind of has, you know, some strategic value. You you would you would think, but nothing they do tactically makes sense and you know, may, maybe they talk about, you know, I I think it might play into the Jedi's cockiness where they never think they need help anyway. So she's just like, <laughs> yeah, I can go do this cuz you kind of see that throughout this episode the Jedi being like, yeah, we'll just do whatever. <laughs> That's kind of a theme of the show and uh things we talk about is that they just don't care they just go do whatever they do and even when they're wrong they never admit they're wrong and maybe that's why they fell but anyway they go to she goes to find poggle he drops a a box because he's carrying all these boxes so he's kind of leaving a trail that she finds and they they go and basically into a temple she goes into a temple she radios the jedi to tell him she's there they kind of warn her not to do it because a sandstorm's coming and they can't really follow her, but she does it anyway because she's a Jedi, as we just discussed. And uh, she she goes in there and she is able to send one kind of communication where she is attacked. And then, basically, the transmission goes out. So Obi-Wan and Anakin are nervous and they decide that they're going to go try and get her, but they have to wait for the sandstorm to end. Now, the sandstorm ends and they go to the temple and uh, they find her lightsaber, but they can't find her. But they know this is not good. 
And there are rumors floating around that there might be a giant Geonosian queen, and they have hive minds, and there's a big kind of statue of her. I don't know if that reminds you of any movies you've seen before, Mark, but... Uh... No, 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 this is a completely new and original thought that has never been done in the history of... Uh television or science fiction exactly so they they go into this temple anyway and they start to get attacked by some geonosians but there's something a little different about these geonosians they're zombies so yay zombies we get zombie geonosians which makes them a little harder to fight because they keep lightsabering through them and they just keep coming even though their limbs are being hacked off and whatnot because they're dead but but you're still freaking jedi i mean they're just zombie bugs yeah right you should be able to force push the entire lot of them away from you. Um, exactly. They never show more than five at one given point in time, so it's not like there's you know, thousands of them. Yeah, I mean, they never really seemed threatening at any point, even though the episode wanted them to seem threatening. Even to the clone troopers, they should have been easier to dispatch than they were, but that was how they tried to ratchet up the tension, was kind of saying we can't, we can't stop them because they can't be killed because they're already dead. Um... Uh, so they keep making their way through the catacombs. We're, we're going to go through this episode pretty fast because I have a feeling about where both of us are thinking on this. Uh, Luminara awakens and finds out she's being carried by Poggle the Lesser and some of these zombies who obviously don't have any problem with him. Uh, and we find out that the Geonosian Hive Queen is there, not surprisingly, and she is, uh, as you might expect, based on some other movies, kind of a... A bug-type lady sitting on what looks like a giant egg sack. Um, you can, know? I, can I say something? Yeah. She looked like a combination of the Xenomorph Queen and those aliens from Sesame Street. They're always in the window going, yup, 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 That is very accurate and had not occurred to me, so well done. Yeah, that is that is pretty true. Uh, and and they take her there, and the, droid que- or the Hive Queen doesn't kill... Luminar just kind of ties her up, which everyone finds kind of odd. So the the Jedi have their fights, and the only way they were able to to beat Anakin and Obi Wan were able to beat the zombies was by collapsing the cave on them, and they're able to sneak into where the hive the the hive queen is. And Obi Wan kind of realizes, well, they haven't killed her, so they must want her for some purpose. And I'm an arrogant ass, so I'm just gonna say, let's not fight them and kill them all immediately and get out of here. I'm gonna try and see what their plan is. He does tell the clone troopers that are with him to kind of spread out and says, when I signal you, flash your lights because it'll blind them, which I'm not really sure why a zombie would have working eye orbitals, but we won't get into that. And uh, Obi-Wan and Anakin just kind of walk up to this queen to be like, hey, what's uh, what's the deal? And um, something did strike me in this episode, and I'm not sure if they're, they were going for this, but it's what came across to me is they have a conversation, the, the Hive Queen and the Jedi, and the Jedi just basically say, hey, we just invaded and took over your planet. You're going to submit to us and all our laws. And she's like, no, fuck that. And I suddenly kind of went, maybe I'm kind of on your side because you're just living down here in your hole and these dudes invaded your planet and now tell you you have to go by their law. Uh, yeah, I don't know that I've ever got anything to add at this point Yeah, uh, on this particular episode. Yeah, the Je- Jedi are dicks, basically, is what <laughs> comes down to. And then they have a, the Hive Queen has a worm she's going to put in uh, Luminara, much like a facehugger would, and that's going to allow her to mind control the Jedi. So she wants all three Jedi there. They basically, they turn on the lights and blind everyone and kill everyone and escape. And that's basically how this one comes to an end um it's a ripoff of aliens i didn't have a bad time watching it but it's i won't remember it in 15 minutes it's it's very blah i looked at my watch a lot um i yeah i like horror stuff so you know but it there there wasn't anything interesting i thought about this horror stuff this is just one to this was one to get through basically yeah you know i mean if you're going to steal material, you certainly can do worse for source material than Alien. And um, also Star Trek Two, which is where the brain worm comes from, and I'm a little uh, disappointed that you didn't realize that. Oh, yeah. Um, so it, it wasn't that it was a, a you know, derivative. That was my real issue with it. My problem was is another example of, oh, a woman makes a stupid decision and goes into distress, and the smart, savvy 
men have to go save her. Um, I, I spent a lot of time, I spent the whole episode actually really bothered by that. Um, especially since you have a character in Anakin who's supposed to be hot-headed, who's supposed to be impetuous, who is supposed to be doing the exact kind of things that Luminara did. Yep. Right? But it, it seems, in, in the few episodes I've seen, it, it's as if, to me, they keep passing up on the opportunity to build him as this, you know, impending villain in order to pass off the negative traits basically to female characters who are less competent than him. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a real issue and it, it doesn't like you say, it doesn't make sense narratively and it's annoying that they keep doing this. I mean the the nice thing is you, you didn't watch the last episode and the last episode was too I suppose they didn't need to be saved in the end, but it was too um it was too Padawan women kind of controlling the episode and causing the victory. And they kind of, they self-sacrificed to get it and then had to be kind of bailed out from their self-sacrifice. But it, it, it's one of those things where you just wish they could hit a tone and stick with it. Like we see blip, blips of what we want out of these narratives, but then they just kind of revert back in the next episode. My, my hope for this episode is that we get more of brain worms. And I haven't looked forward as to what the next episodes are. This seemed like a natural ending, but Obi-Wan sure spent a lot of time trying to get a brain worm and not wanting the brain worm to be killed. And then it got killed. Um, which made me think like maybe these would, that was hopefully foreshadowing that these are going to come back into play and Obi-Wan's not going to know how to deal with it because he didn't get to study it like he wanted to. Um, cause I do like the concept of the brain worm. But you know that this is the uh, this is just well, this was just an episode. Gee, do you think that it might be that one of the clone troopers who escaped is infected by the brain worm, and that that's how that gets onto the ship in a way that is absolutely not a parallel at all as to how Kate Bane escaped? No, uh, in no. The previous episode? No, I don't believe that. There's no chance of that happening. No, no, <laughs> they wouldn't go back to that well. Exactly. So for me, I give this I give this two and a half pews, which is my I saw it and I'll forget it level ranking. Um, what's your meh scale? It's a one and a half. Nice. One and a half miss that uh, was drawn down from a, a two and a half uh, because of the women in distress angle. Yep, yeah, that is fair. So let's uh, let's move on from this episode and let's hit other nerd stuff. And I'm a nerd. We have news for the beautiful people. There's a lot more of us in our view. Mark, what you got for us this week? Okay, so are you familiar with the term fridging? No. Oh, um, that's is that different than women in refrigerators? No, it's 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 the short version. Of okay, that. I I wasn't aware of the shorthand, but I'm very familiar with women in refrigerators. But you should explain nonetheless. Yeah, it's basically the verbing of women in refrigerators. Um, so. Back in 1999, Gail uh, Simone, um, a very well-known comic book writer, coined the term women in refrigerators, and she started a website about it. And what this was is um, a, a female writer's attempt to catalog all of the times, of, specifically comic book narratives, that female characters were abused, tortured, depowered, mutilated, and killed for no other reason than providing um, motivation for the male characters. Um, she got the term from a Green Lantern comic book where the Green Lantern comes home to find his girlfriend has been murdered, dismembered, and shoved into the fridge by an unfortunately named villain called Major Force, which would be a good porn name. <laughs> um, and this was a, a girlfriend who was basically not, like, she was introduced just to be murdered. Like, it wasn't a long-standing character or anything. Like, she right. came in, like, the issue before or even that issue. Right, exactly. So, <clears throat> it, it became kind of a rallying cry for a lot of um, female creators. Um, and it became something that, uh, you know, I think really wound up having a lot of positive impact on world because it, it really did make a lot of writers kind of reassess okay how are we using female characters uh, how are we not highlighting them uh, how are we marginalizing them and so of course this episode that we just watched really kind of made me start thinking about that because in essence Luminara is sort of fringed in this episode she makes a stupid choice that doesn't make a lot of sense and then she's put in peril just to motivate open 
Obi-Wan and Anakin. So I watched this uh, episode on Monday, and, uh, I, you know, I was bothered by this element of it. And so then um, the next day I was thinking, you know, I really want to read, watch something that's kind of the opposite of this. I, I want to find something that feels like this features a strong female character, you know, has a, a strong female viewpoint, uh, just to kind of, you know, sort of balance my karma. Right. And so what I did was I went to my local comic shop and I found Kelly Thompson's Hawkeye Anchor Points, which you can't see, but I'm showing a copy of the book to uh, Luke right now. So now this is, um, for anybody who's familiar with Marvel Comics, this is basically a continuation of Matt Fraction's Hawkeye, which... Um, for my money, is the greatest 12 issues of a comic book ever written by somebody not named Alan Moore. Um, I mean, I don't know how strong you feel about it. I know I bought you copies of it. Oh, it's great. Day or Christmas. It's great, and it would have made the best Marvel uh, Netflix show. Yes, and in, in fact, it's when it comes to the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, I don't generally care about them making changes to the characters because, you know, whatever. It's a different medium different audience and that's fine the only thing that really ticked me off is how they portrayed Hawkeye because the version in that comic would be so awesome to have on the Avengers and just in that universe um, and they completely ruined it by making Hawkeye a you know, woodworker with a family out in the country yeah. um, anyway so this book was originally this is basically kind of the spiritual sequel even if it isn't the direct sequel um and because I loved that original Hawkeye so much, I had been kind of resistant um, to reading this because you know, perfect twelve issues. Didn't want to spoil it with uh, you know a True Detective season two kind mm -hmm. of subpar follow up. But um, I had managed to read a couple other things that, by Kelly Thompson and uh, really liked the voice she brought, and so I decided to go ahead and and give this a try, and it's fantastic. Um, it, it follows the other Hawkeye, which is a 19-ish-year-old girl named Kate Bishop, um, as she moves to L.A. to become a private investigator. And, you know, she doesn't have a lot of superpowers, um, other than she's really good with the bow and arrow. Um, she's not a very good private investigator. She can't even afford the license. You know, she's fumbling through the, the whole process. Um, but it's just, it's really fun, it's really light, um, it features a strong, interesting female protagonist, um, it has an appearance in a couple issues by Jessica Jones, who is another great, strong Marvel female protagonist. And I, I was going to say in my head as you're describing it, that's what popped into my head, is that it sounded relatively similar to Jessica Jones. It, it, it is, but it's a much more lighthearted, humorous um, approach. Um, this Hawkeye, you know, it doesn't have the traumatic backstory. She was basically a rich girl who decided to become an archer and then became really good at it. So it, it doesn't have that kind of baggage. It doesn't have those dark overtones, um, you know, that sort of despair, depression feeling to it. Um, but it, it is kind of similar, sure. at, at least basic concept. Um, and so I got that. I read it. It was the Perfect karmic balance. I went and ordered the other uh, other two trades from Amazon, so they'll be coming here shortly. Um, I'm also really excited too because she's done writing this book, but then the next book that she's written is she started writing is West Coast Avengers, which basically features Kate now starting up uh, a branch of Avengers on the West Coast in LA, and so. Um, I'm really excited that I'll have that one going forward. Nice. So, um, yeah, that's that's uh, Mark's pick of the week. What did she write previously before Hawk, Hawkeye, do you know? Um, well, let's see. She's written a lot of independent stuff. Um, she wrote a Rogue and Gambit miniseries. Okay. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm looking right else. Um, she wrote A-Force, which was uh, a volume of Avengers that basically filled an featured an all-female team. Okay. Um, she's also currently writing the new Jessica Jones volumes. Oh, nice. Um, so, and and I haven't 
read all of that, and I, I don't know how much we'll be getting to at any specific, uh, you know, near point in time because there's a lot to read. I do know they're rebooting Uncanny X Men um, with several writers, and she's going to be one of those. Oh, nice. um, but she's basically is kind of one of the, sort of their their next wave of talent that's coming in, and she hasn't necessarily gotten the huge titles or really long runs. But you can tell that Marvel's got a lot of faith in her and that they're really kind of grooming her to sort of be in that kind of next generation talent that they have. And so I'm really excited for what she's going to be producing. Um, and it just, a, in general, with Marvel right now, I'm really impressed with their sort of their second tier characters, the kind of, of talent that they're bringing in. Um, you know, they're really emphasizing female writers, um, emphasizing... Um, LBGTQ people, you know, um, non-white writers, and, and they're producing just fantastic comics that are, um, even if they're not setting the world on fire as far as complicated plots, it's just great characterizations um, from different perspectives that you don't often think of, and they're some of the most fun stuff I've read in a really long time. Um, you know, for it's just you're smiling the whole time you're reading it, and so um, yeah, to uh, all uh, 10, 15, 20, or a million of you out there, uh, I recommend to go get uh, Hawkeye Volume One Anchor Points by Kelly Thompson. Perfect. Well, it is about that time for us to wrap things up for the week. You can find Maya when he is here at Maya Madrid on Twitter. I am at Luke underscore Neitzel, N-E-I-T-Z-E-L. Mark, I'm assuming you are still not on anything? Uh, no, I am maintaining my boycott until Alex Jones is removed from Twitter. Perfect. Uh, you can find us as a show at Kids Seriously. And until next time, we will see you. Later. Thanks for listening to Kids Seriously. If you didn't completely hate us, feel free to hit like, subscribe, or tell a friend about the show. If you want to write to us and tell us how much we suck, or just ask a question, you can reach us at kidsseriouslyradio at gmail.com. Otherwise, hit us up on Twitter at Kids Seriously. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.